I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're diving into a powerful and emotional narrative written by a wonderful author. Her name is Maureen Santora. She has penned a powerful book. It is called The Day the Towers Fell, the story of September 11, 2001. Maureen's heartfelt tribute to her son, Christopher, who was one of the brave firefighters who lost their lives on that fateful day, provides a touching and educational account of the events of 9-11. This book not only honors the memory of her son, but also serves as an important educational tool for young readers. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Atticus Publishing for helping us put her in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support authors like her by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing her amazing book. It's an important book. Every child should have this book. The links are below this interview. Maureen, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Thank you for joining me. And thank you for having me, Logan. It's good to meet you and see you as well. It's my pleasure. What a great book you've written, a book for children to tell them the story of 9-11. And it begins just the way I remember September 11, 2001. I was in New York City, and it was the most beautiful day you could ever imagine. The sun was bright. The air was crisp. You know, you sipped your coffee that morning, were happy to be alive. And it turned out to be the darkest day in American history by far. You know, thousands of people killed, thousands of innocents, hundreds of real life American heroes like your son, and iconic towers ripped apart, Washington under attack, and a plane that looks like it was headed to the White House, you know, disabled uh, and crashed in a field in Pennsylvania. Horrible, horrible events. You, of course, paid the ultimate price, losing your precious son, Christopher, your only son of five children. That was the day you retired, the first day of your retirement. And what you thought would be a joyous celebration turned out to be an unbelievable nightmare. Tell me what happened on 9-11 for you and your family. Well, it, as you say, there were no clouds in the sky. And in New York, that's very unusual. It was a beautiful blue day. And I, I expected to have a wonderful, wonderful, you know, entire day because it was my first day of retirement. And we received a call from my, my son-in-law telling us to go to the window, look out the window. And uh, our uh, apartment faces Manhattan. So we saw the towers every day. And as we went to the window, we saw the black smoke from what, I now know is Tower 2. I didn't realize that, you know, from the distance. And as we were looking out the window, we saw the second plane come around and hit Tower Number 2. And uh, we knew then, you know, the first, I, I think most people, you know, who saw the, the first plane hit thought, well, it might have been an accident. Maybe the plane had been hit by somebody who had a heart attack or, you know, because you couldn't miss these towers. They were so gigantic. But the second plane, everybody knew this was not just an accident. So as we watched, um, we uh, were at, watching out the window about 15 minutes, and we received a call from the uh, lieutenant in Christopher's firehouse. Um, his firehouse is in mid-Manhattan by uh, Times Square on 48th Street and, and uh, at 8th Avenue. And um, he asked that Christopher come back to work. Now, he had worked the night before. And we expected him to be home. And um, we said, well, he's not home. And there was dead silence on the phone. And my husband, who uh, had spent 40 years in the fire department, he retired as a deputy chief, knew immediately that Christopher was down at the site. He knew immediately. And he knew that this was a terrible, terrible scene. So we spent the day trying to figure out what was happening because we didn't know, you know, what was going on. And um, we went... Uh, my husband went down to um, to find out because he had been an officer for many, many years and uh, nobody had any information. And we finally found out that Christopher was among the missing, you know. Now, I never thought he was not going to come home. I figured that he was smart enough. He was wise enough. He was intelligent enough that he'd figure out a way how to get home. So I kept waiting for him to come home. And I went down to the site, uh, spent all night, you know, trying to figure out and um, came back the next morning. And uh, he was filled with dust. Uh, what was down at that site, and we went every two weeks after September 11th, um, was just dust. 
just tons and tons of paper and dust and, and piles. So he came home. He was absolutely filthy. He you know, ran and took a shower and everything. And then, of course, we started to call. And, um, you know, the day turned out uh, in, in chaos. And my daughters were at work. They couldn't call us. We couldn't call them because there were no phones. And the TVs um, in New York City were all down because the tower had the, you know, um, the connection from all the TVs. And the only TVs that we could, you know, uh, TV station that we could get was from New Jersey. And so when they started to feed that into the net, you know, ABC, NBC, you know, so forth, then we started to get information. But nobody knew what was going on. It was just, just horrible, horrible, horrible. And out of that terrible, terrible event, you know, came a unity in America that I've never seen before. Never, never seen before. People came together. People, you know, had kindness in their heart. They were, you know, um, there was no hatred for a long time. And I wish that time with no hatred was back again. That's what I wish, you know, so. Yeah. Horrible day for you. Um, it's 23 years now, next week. Yeah. Um, will you go to the ceremonies in downtown Manhattan? No, we don't go downtown anymore. What we've done for the last, I would say about 15 years is we go to the firehouse. There were 15 guys who died, you know, in, in that firehouse, more than in any other single firehouse in the city. And um, it, it's like almost like a reunion, seeing the families yeah. again. You know, their children yeah. have grown, our children have grown. We now have grandchildren. So it's a it's a beautiful day. And the firemen who were working on that day, they all come back. Many of them and most of them, I think, are retired. I think the last one retired just a couple of months ago. But uh, they all come back, so we get to see them. They were extraordinary people when we were down at the firehouse. They greeted us with love and 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 just they, they couldn't do enough for us. They were just e extraordinary. And of course, they were working down, you know, for months, and many of them had to retire early because of the dust and the toxic fumes, and they got ill and so forth. But um, we do that in the morning, and then we go to St. Patrick's uh, Cathedral for a special mass for the firefighters. And um, then after that, we have like lunch with the, the firehouse and then we go down to ground zero. And it's, it, for me, it's peaceful. And I need, it, I need it to be a peaceful day, you know, to get through the day. And this year is going to be very hard because my son was 23. So he will be dead as long as he is alive, you know, was alive. And so it, it's, it's hitting me harder, you know, um, but every every year around this time, about a month before, I get this pit in my stomach and I'm not quite sure what. And then I realize when we're getting close to September 11th and it's just, um, I guess, something that, you know, you live with, you know, and uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it is what it is. That's all I can say, you know. You never get over it, of course. Uh, any death you never get over. That's you right. just learn to live with it. That's but when you have a horrific death like this, obviously it's a thousand fold. Um, what troubles me and perhaps it troubles you as well is I feel September 11th could happen again. I feel like not really much has been learned. I feel that the preparations and precautions that we should be taking really haven't been taken. They stop people like me and you at the airport and pat us down like we're criminals while letting people who, I'm sorry, look suspicious, you know, walk right on through. And we got to have some common sense in this country where we actually do profile who is more likely to be a terrorist and who is not, rather than trying to treat the 350 million people in this country as all potential threats, because we're not. Those are my two cents. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I, happen, I happen to agree with you. Um, years ago, uh, we uh, took a trip and we went across Canada. And my father, who at the time was 90 years old, hmm. went with us. But he didn't travel with us. He met us and uh, we went out through um, Niagara Falls. And so we came up to Niagara Falls with us and then drove, you know, flew home. And as he was going home, he was trip searched. And my father was a tiny, petite, you know, individual. He had no, he had a little bag, you know, with him because he was only staying, but he was strip searched. And and my my children were beside themselves. And I said, you can't say anything because it'll get worse. Uh, and the when we when he went through, we said, why why would you, you know, you had other people who had turbans, who were bigger, who were, you know, um, 
looked more menacing than this little old man, you know, who was like 95 pounds. And they said, well, you know, the, the old people are the ones that carry the weapons. And I said, you have to be kidding me. You know, we were, but he was so upset over that. I mean, it really, you know, it was unnecessary and um, he was beside himself. But those kinds of things happen a lot. And they happen to average individuals. And um, I'm all for security. I believe that, you know, if everybody gets checked, everybody should get checked. But you shouldn't just pick out you know, people who are unsuspecting, who obviously are not, you know, uh, you right. know terrorists, use some common sense. You use some common exactly. sense. You know? Yeah, so. if you come from a country where there's a history of terrorism, I'm sorry, you should be more suspect than a person like you and me who come from New York City. Right. I mean, I agree. and a person like yourself who's paid the ultimate sacrifice, who's lost a son in this war against terror. I mean, because that's basically what it is. He was a soldier that day. He just didn't have a weapon. Right. And we didn't know that we were being attacked like we were. Um, let's focus a little bit on your book. Your book is great. It's illustrated by your daughter, which I think is terrific as well. So the both of you collaborated on this. And what were you hoping to teach children about that day? Well, I wanted children to know what hatred looks like. And I wanted them to know what hatred does to everybody. Mm. And, you know, no matter what, you know, um, you feel or how much anger you have in your heart, you should never hate anybody because hatred doesn't help you ever. And it certainly doesn't help the person who you're hating because they don't know you hate them. And so they go unscathed and you now are ruining your life with this terrible blackness in, in your heart. And I wanted children to know that, you know, terrible things happen in life and we can't control them. But we have to work very, very hard at being kind and generous in our hearts and being tolerant and being, you know, kind individuals and helpful. And, and you know, so that was really the focus of the book. And I wanted children to know that all the people who died that day were simply going to work. They were doing nothing, nothing more. They were trying to support their families. They were going, thinking that they would have another work day or another, you know, and the firemen came down to help them. So they were doing nothing wrong. The policemen tried to help as well. And, and so all the individuals that died were innocent. And the hatred permeated our entire world and changed our world. And now you cannot go through a... Um, you know, uh, on a train or on an airplane without being, you know, having all these levels of security. You have to have your passport. You have to have your face. You have to, you know, open your bags. You have to take off your shoes. That was never true before 9-11. And anybody born after that doesn't know that. So I wanted kids to understand that hatred was a terrible thing. And I wanted them to know that, you know, in everybody's life, you should live each life to the fullest because it's not how long you live, it's how you live that's important. Exactly, exactly. And um, this, the proceeds from this book are going towards an important cause in your yes. son's name, Christopher yes. Santora. Tell us a little bit about that project well, of we yours. started, you know, when, after 9-11, we had to figure out, you know, what we were going to do with the rest of our lives, you know. And, and I think that's the thing that, that people um, have to know, um, you know, at any traumatic event. You get to choose how you're going to live the rest of your life because you're still around. And my son was uh, an American history buff. So he loved American history. He knew more American history than anybody I've ever met. He read all these books. He knew about the battles. He was constantly telling people, you know, that, you know, things were not correct, you know, in the books and that they had to change them. And, you know, so we decided that we were going to honor his love of history by establishing a, uh, a scholarship in his name to award college scholarships to students who, you know, wanted to fulfill their dreams as well. And his dream was to be a firefighter, even though he had a degree and he taught for a little while in the New York City public schools. So we used New York City as our base originally, and now we've extended it, you know, to the United States. And part of the scholarship is you have to write an essay on a selected topic that we choose every year. And it's it's history-based. It can be current events, but it's not terribly political. It's an open-ended you know, discussion. One of our, our recent um, uh, questions was, what does it mean to you to be an American? Why is being an American important? 
And if it's not important, why is it not important? And so the kids wrote the essay. They uh, send them to me now. And um, uh, we have five judges. I used to have 50 judges in our heyday. We had a lot of, we gave a lot of scholarships, but I, I kind of, yeah, as I get older, it's harder to do all of this. And so we, you know, we have five judges. We remove all of the identification. Alan, I never read the essays. We remove all identification. And the only thing that the judges, you know, judge on is the content of the essay. And they mark it based upon a rubric. They send the results back to me. I then tally up, you know, there are five, you know, judges. So the top, the top score is the winner. And to this day, all the people who have become winners, I think are supposed to be winners because then we read all the other essays and there's something about the, the selection that the judges make. I always think Christopher has his thumb on the, on the scale, picking out the people, you know, and, and um, they're extraordinary human beings. Many of them have gone on to do wonderful, wonderful things, but it's a way of us saying, you know, here's to somebody who had a dream and fulfilled his dream and, Hopefully you'll be able to fill yours as well. So it's wonderful. it's a good thing. It's wonderful that you've taken this tragedy and turned it into something good, a legacy that bears your son's name, that is empowering future generations. And as you spoke before about how it's important for children to learn about 9-11 and about the high price of hate, uh, it struck me that there's a whole generation out there now that wasn't born when 9-11 happened. That's right. So this book is a terrific reminder. It's written by Maureen Santora. It is called The Day the Towers Fell, the story of September 11th, 2001. It is Maureen's heartfelt tribute to her son, Christopher, who was one of the brave firefighters who lost his life on that fateful day. This book provides a touching and educational account of the events of September 11th, 2001. And like we said when we started this program, the darkest day in American history by far, because the bloodshed was right here on our soil and all of the people who were attacked were innocents, uh, including Christopher Santora. Maureen, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you very much, Logan, for having me. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Pleasure speaking with you. God bless you and your family. September 11th and always. To the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time, on Spotlight.